In this video, I want to introduce wave particle duality by looking at the double slit experiment and then looking at de Broglie's hypothesis and therefore considering the wave function. So, first of all, let's consider water waves. Here we have planar water waves approaching a wall with two slits. What is it that we expect to see? Well, the waves interfere. So basically, we have two sources of waves emanating from those two slits, those two gaps in the wall, and therefore, when we have those two sources, we get constructive and destructive interference. And if we were to look at the overall intensity of waves um, detected at a wall on the right-hand side, we'd end up with this kind of varying pattern of increasing and decreasing intensity as a result of the interference between the two waves. Now light also behaves as waves, as we know. So on the left-hand side here, we might have uh, planar waves, uh, such as from a, a laser of a single wavelength, basically. And then we get the two sources again, resulting from the, the screen here with two slits. And we arrive at an interference pattern on the right-hand side. So a single planar wave giving rise to two uh, sources by diffraction, then we get interference of those two sources and we have um, this well-known interference pattern corresponding to wave-like phenomena. Now, what about particles? Well, if we were to have a wall and fire particles at it from the left-hand side here, then classically what we expect for particles of a given size is that we'd end up with two clusters of particles corresponding to the two gaps in this uh, wall here. And that's exactly what we would see with reasonably sized particles. However, when we get down to the very small scale, like electrons, so here we've got electrons being fired towards this wall here with two slits, and these slits are about 60 nanometers wide each and uh, about 4,000 nanometers tall, what we see is now very interesting indeed. We don't see the two uh, clusters like we saw before for the classical particles, what we actually see are multiple clusterings of detected electrons, corresponding very much like to what we saw for the waves and then also for the light waves that we saw. We get an interference pattern. So here is another look at that experiment. We have an electron gun firing electrons at a screen here with two slits in it. They make it through this screen to then be detected and result unusually in an interference pattern, completely unexpected and yet experimentally observed. The electrons are behaving as if they are waves. So here is another look at that. This is a representation of the intensity of those waveforms as we get this interference pattern forming. And then what we observe is detection by detection by detection, we get these uh, electron clusters being detected on the right hand side. Each black dot here being a single detected electron. Now what gets really interesting here is what if we put the electrons through one by one. So this is to really turn down the frequency of emission of those electrons from that electron gun. So if we do that, so for example, if we look at only detecting 11 electrons on that screen on the right hand side, we get this result here. As we move on to 200, 6,000, all the way up to 140,000, one by one electron detections, we still see we get this interference pattern, these multiple clusters of electrons. So that can only mean that each and every single electron, one by one, has gone through both slits. Each electron has behaved like a wave. Now, this is what, in fact, Louis de Broglie had hypothesized and put forward in his PhD thesis in 1924. And in fact, he ended up getting the Nobel Prize because this was eventually experimentally demonstrated. So he postulated that electrons have a wave nature. And in fact, that all matter has wave-like properties. So this was his hypothesis, that if you have mass times velocity, momentum of a particle, then it is in fact associated with a particular wavelength lambda. And so this is the wave particle duality. This is the wave, the wavelength lambda, and this is the conventional particle understanding of mass times velocity, its momentum. 
And so, as we've been seeing already, this wave-like behaviour of electrons has in fact been experimentally demonstrated and it was done in 1927 by Thompson, son of, son of the famous J.J. Thompson who discovered the electron. And in fact, in 1937, Thompson shared the Nobel Prize with C.J. Davison who had independently also demonstrated this electron interference pattern. And so Louis de Broglie won the Nobel Prize in 1929 because of those experiments actually confirming his uh, 1924 hypothesis. So let's have a quick look at this lambda equals h over p expression. Does it make any sense at all? Well this is a very crude check of its reasonableness. So I'm starting off here with the famous e equals mc squared expression from Einstein and then on the right hand side here we're using the the photon energy E, so this is an expression for light, being a Planck's constant H times the frequency F. Let's unpack that a bit. Well, first of all, then, if we use E equals HF and put that into this E equals MC squared, we end up with HF is equal to MC squared. Now, we know that the speed of light C is equal to frequency times wavelength of light. So let's work with that. Let's substitute, therefore, for F. F is C over lambda, so we have HC over lambda now is equal to mc squared and now we make an observation that momentum is mass times velocity so we can take one of the c's here from the c squared and say that's a velocity times a mass so if we put that in we get hc over lambda is equal to p which is mass times one of those velocities leaving just one of the velocities c behind so pc and in fact that directly results in the h over lambda equals to p which is the same as lambda is equal to h over p. So this does seem, at least dimensionally, a reasonable thing to say. And of course, this was experimentally demonstrated. And here again is another example, a uh, schematic of the experiment. We have an electron gun firing electrons at two slits. You get what must be wave-like phenomena, even single electron by single electron, resulting in these um, detections of electrons one by one, which can effectively be understood as the wave function collapsing to a single point when they're observed or detected. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. First of all, let's have another look at uh, a simulation now. So this is an electron represented by a wave function that is passing through both slits. So Notice that if we were, in fact, by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, to claim to know the exact velocity of that electron, then we'd have no idea where it is at all. So here, then, that's why we can represent an electron as a wave packet where we have some knowledge of its velocity, but not exact knowledge. Um, and so that's why we have this kind of local wave approaching these two slits. Let's take another look with another um, animation. There is the electron, and this is approaching slits. Um, these are 60 nanometers wide, four microns tall, and the electron as a wave function is now interfering, um, resulting in this interference pattern, which will collapse to a single detection point on a screen on the right-hand side. So let's take a closer look at what that wave function is. Here I'm representing a profile through that wave function calling it psi as a function of position x. And as we know, that wave function has passed through both slits. That means it, the electron could have been in many possible positions simultaneously. This is known as a superposition of states. And so this wave function is related to the probability of finding the electron at a given position x. So let's see that now, representing this wave function as a sum of position states. And I'm going to use the delta function, but basically it's a very narrow, tall function which says that if we have a position say, state delta x, such as this one here, then we would be claiming we know exactly where the particle is. And so here I'm just showing lots and lots of position states where each and every single one of them would correspond to a claim of saying the particle is here, 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 or here. And so I'm just considering lots of different possible positions. And then we express the overall wave function as a summation over these position states, delta x, 
each of them located at every possible position x prime along that axis. And in fact, the coefficient for each of those, um, those position states corresponding to the amplitude here is just given by the wave function amplitude itself. Sum them all up and that gives us the wave function. So what we're saying then is that an electron is a wave function which passes through both slits and that wave function relates to the probability of finding the particle at any given position x. So the wave function is a summation of many possible positions delta x and we consider all the positions x prime where it could have been. So here is now a time varying wave function on the left hand side here. I can fix that in time to represent this equation here. And when we detect, observe or measure that wave function, we only get one particular position state. And the probability of getting that particular state relates to this overall wave function on the left hand side here. And so, in fact, to get the probability density function, we just take uh, the complex conjugate of the wave function, because in general, psi is a complex number. Take the complex conjugate, multiply it by uh, the wave function value psi, and then you get, in fact, the probability density function. And so what we're showing here is a wave function changing with time, and this corresponds to the phenomenon of quantum tunneling, where, in fact, uh, a particle can be found either side of this barrier. So I hope that's given you some insight into understanding wave functions and therefore wave particle duality for the case of an electron. Thanks for listening.